courtesy of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. We're back. I'm Dan alongside Matt as we kick off our 10th season. Matt, it's been nine full seasons and we're entering season 10 of the show. Can you believe it? Yeah, well, we've talked a lot and we've made a lot of fun of the Oilers and we'll continue to make fun of the Oilers. Cause I was reflecting on that today, thinking, how have I put up with Matt for nine whole seasons so far? I know. I have the same feelings, man. <laughs> we, I only see him once a week for a couple hours. That's how how we you know keep things keep things uh, going. But anyway, why don't we jump right into it, shall we, man? Yep. Um, we won't get too far into the games that have been played. There's a lot of other stuff to talk about. We haven't really talked since free agency opened. But just for the sake of completeness, let's talk about the first three games. We won't go back to the rookie tournament. Uh, the Flames opened their preseason this year with a game against the Edmonton Oilers in the Saddledome. For some reason, I was about to say the Pengrove Saddledome, but the Scotiabank Saddledome. And it was a 4 nothing Oilers win. And I saw all sorts of Oilers fans online who were talking about how great their team was and how Calgary sucks because, you know, they won 4 nothing. I, I don't know. I mean, you can't really say that with this team. If you look at the rosters that were fielded, we were missing a lot of our top players. But, you know, it, it's preseason hockey. It doesn't say much. Yeah. Um, generally, I tend to look at, like, especially when a goalie's auditioning for a spot like Daniel Vladar, uh, that I want to see, like, how he is composed during the preseason games and, like, is he ready? And, like, a couple of years ago, we saw that uh, Riddick, he gave up seven goals in one game and, you know, uh, we... You left after the second of that game, you are so upset. Yeah, well, it, was, it wasn't that I actually had something was else I had the... to do, but yeah. Was that the game when we posted the picture of you with the gas mask on because Riddick was so stinky? Yeah, that was it, yeah. And, but, you know, Vladar in this game, uh, even though the Oilers scored twice on him, he looked rather composed and solid in net and made a few really good saves. And for a goalie trying to establish himself as the NHL backup um, full-time for the first time in his career. I think that was a good start for him. I thought both goalies looked good in this one. I thought Adam Warner looked pretty good, too. Yeah, I I was less confident with Warner. Uh, He just... But how much of that do you think was Warner versus how much of that do you think at the time the team wasn't looking as good? Oh, true. Um, The fluidity of the movements with Warner, they weren't quite as smooth as what uh, Vladar was doing, but, you know, it it was okay. Um, I think that if uh, the Flames needed to go with Warner for uh, a few games, like if either of the goalies get hurt for any time i think that would be okay but uh yeah it's not like it's one of those where it's not a guy that you're expecting to make the nhl right away and i think this year more than bringing warner up um i think if the flames need a goalie and we can talk more about him later i think you might see wolf get a cup of coffee just because i think they want to get a look at him yeah i can see that especially later on in the year um, not a whole lot to talk about here. I guess the only real story is Derek Ryan scored against the Flames, but not a lot I think we need to break down on this one. Yeah, it's preseason and the first couple of games of the preseason, and you could tell that the Flames are trying to learn Daryl Sutter's way of playing. And you could even especially see that in how the shot totals were, where like the, the Flames really weren't caring about generating offense too much 15 shots to the oilers 49 yeah and like they were trying to keep the oilers shots to the outside and learning the proper defensive positioning of course you know if you're in a situation like that uh your um the amount of shots against and like the overall style of play is not going to be pretty because of the fact that you're trying to make a complete different way of doing things habit and getting that muscle memory going and it takes a minute and we've seen that in the past when uh, the Flames acquire like a new defenseman and it takes them like eight or ten games into the regular season for them to like start really getting the feel of the team 
And I think that, like, the whole team, because they're adapting to Daryl's new way of doing things, that it might take them a minute to sort everything out and be able to just quickly do the, the right things. I think like you said they're adapting to Daryl's system, but there's also a lot of these guys just haven't played in a while. So, True. Uh, you know, it's the usual preseason rust plus a new coach and a new way of doing things. Yeah, because basically, like, the Flames have been a loosey-goosey... Uh, run and gun team since the rebuild and um, you know like defense hasn't really been a priority for this team and Daryl's mantra is you play defense first and you play defense all the time and you generate offense off of turnovers mostly and or when you actually do get the puck you, you know, like, it's not necessarily turnovers, but when you do get the puck, whether it's off of face-offs or that, then you generate things off the rush. But it, the primary thing is limiting the opponent's scoring chances, the shot totals, the chance totals, in hopes of making it so that they can't beat you. Who do you think the flame with the most time on ice for this game was? I'm not sure. Eric Goodbranson. I was going to say that, but I wasn't quite confident. But that does make sense because... Uh, he was the most veteran of the defensemen on the ice, so they relied on him quite a bit. Yeah, and plus uh, he, Stone, uh, Shillington, and Mackey are frankly vying for the last spots on the roster. So it makes sense to put those guys out there and get a lot of reps in to see... Which, if any, will actually take the job and run with it. I agree. All right, well, let's move on to the next game. The next game was a game not played in an NHL rink. This was the Calgary Flames playing against the Vancouver Canucks in the Abbotsford Center, an interesting city, a city that uh, Calgary previously had a farm team in, and now uh, the Canucks have a farm team in. So kind of a weird neutral ground in a way between the two teams. Yeah. And uh, again, the Flames lost 4-2 to two against the Canucks. Calgary goals from Dylan Dubé and Connor Mackey both came in the second. Any overall thoughts on this one? Um, it was. I thought it was very much the same as what yeah. you said. The team still looks like they're trying to figure it, out their identity. Yeah, like they did generate a little bit more offense in this game. They did actually score a couple goals. But, yeah, it was a rough-looking game. And the team didn't really play that well. Vladar did all right. Werner did all and right. And also a lot less names on this roster. Like, even mm-hmm. if I just look at the forwards, Richie Dubé, Ferrosi, Phillips, Godin, Philippe, uh, Peltier, Kirkland, Dewar, Ruzhishka, Pospisil, and Mangiapani. So, I mean, it's pretty much an AHL roster with a few NHL guys sprinkled in. Yeah. Which is typical. So, um, should we move on to the next one? Yep. We'll start doing better reviews of some of these games when the season starts, but there's a lot to talk about tonight. Uh, the next one was our first game in history against the Seattle Kraken, the new uh, 32nd team in the NHL coming to the Dome for the first time. And, of course, Mark Giordano has to score in his return to Calgary. Um, this was a 4-3 Kraken shootout win. Calgary goals came from Matthew Kachuk, Michael Stone, and Michael Backlund. Any overall thoughts on this one? Uh, now that you're seeing more of a veteran lineup, the, the team's playing better, which makes sense. Um, I think that this team, um, the player that stood out the most for me was Oliver Shillington. Um, I think that he, uh, was using his speed effectively in, both in the defensive zone and in the transition to the offensive zone. And, uh, the player that he's pretty much since we drafted him that he's reminded me the most of is uh, TJ Brody, where the offensive skills were always there, but the how to play NHL level defense wasn't. And it seems that Shillington might have figured out to some extent how to play defense at the NHL level, which if that's the case, then that would be amazing. Um, and his foot speed definitely helps on the blue line. It's one game. Don't get too excited. Oh, no, I know. It's one of those things that, you know, like, hey, that's a positive check mark. Great. Now go do that again. <laughs> and then again. And then again. Yep. But, you know, it, it. you couldn't ask for more 
in this situation based off of the situation and as a whole for Shillington. I think Shillington probably also realizes, I'd say for the first time since he's turned pro, he's really got to fight for a spot on this team. And I think that might be helping with some of what you're seeing as well. Yeah. Well, and I'm sure that uh, Sutter is not going to sugarcoat things that, you know, if you want to play in the NHL, you actually have to play like an NHLer. And, you know, what you're doing thus far has not been that. So, you know, get your butt in gear if you want to actually have an NHL career or enjoy time in Europe, to be blunt. Yeah. No, yeah, I think I think you're right. And we'll come back. I have some questions for you later about Shillington. We'll come back to him. But let's uh, rewind. We've got five more preseason games still on the docket, but let's rewind out of the preseason, Matt, yep. back to... Uh, July, when free agency started. I want to say July 1st. It's just so natural. Was it July 28th or something this year? Yeah. We'll just say July 1st, and yeah. <laughs> free agent season. Yeah. July, insert date. Yeah. Um, Flames made a whole whack of signings this year, so I'll go through them all, or let's go through them one at a time. I would say the biggest name, probably, was the addition of Blake Coleman. Six-year deal, $4.9 million average per season. He'll be wearing number 20 here in Calgary. Uh, this is a guy who's played his whole career in the NHL in New Jersey and Tampa Bay. Um, knows what it takes to go to a Stanley Cup. I think this is a pretty good addition. You and I talked about the Flames needing to bring on a winger, and they brought on that winger. What do you think of this addition? Um, for the generic type of player that he is, so for fans that aren't familiar with Blake Coleman, um, the player that it, he reminds me the most of is Curtis Glencross. Uh, but just better in all areas frankly um why does he remind you of glennie uh just that good two-way forward he who can chip in a little bit of offense play a good defense um hit uh be engaged physically and you know agitate a bit but not over the line like you know just one of those solid middle six guys that just makes your team better and can help contribute by chipping in a goal here and there. Yeah, and I mean, this is a guy who's put up 30 points pretty regular these last couple seasons. Um, he put up, what, 31 last year, 32 the year before, 36 and 25. So, like you said, it's sort of a middle six, probably a second line winger. I think, you know, 30-odd 30, 30 points are going to be a welcome addition to this team. Yeah, and uh, most of his points are actually goals, um, generally. Um, so, you know, like, it, it's one of those where if he's get... He was kind of uh, buried on Tampa Bay's third line, and um, which, you know, there's a reason why Tampa won the Cup twice in a row. Um, when you have guys that are that good that far down in the lineup. And if um, he's getting more of an opportunity, um, say, playing with, say, Lindholm and uh, Kachuk, as we saw, um, you could easily see him being a 40, 50, 60 point player, depending on the caliber of his line mates and the amount of ice time he gets. The signing very much reminds me, not the type of player, but sort of the type of signing reminds me of Yari Hoodler, a guy who yeah. came to Calgary because he was buried in a lineup and looking for more opportunity. And I get the same sense here with Blake Coleman. He signed a big deal. He's, you know, six years. He knows he's going to get a better shot in Calgary, and he's going to be a key piece. Um, and I think at 4.9, that I mean, if you look at our, our sort of contract structure, that's not a contract that's going to bite us in the butt probably. Um, you know, maybe the last couple of years, he's what, 30, 29 now? Yeah. So be 35 when the deal's over. But even then, I think you could see this being a, a real value in the first couple of years. Yeah. And with how he plays defensively, that even if he his offensive game regresses in, say, year four, five, six. You're probably right, yeah. Then, you know, like he'll still be a viable third line right winger who can play physically in the same mold as Milan Lucic. I was going to say, if we're paying Luch 5-odd, we can pay uh, Coleman 4-9. Yeah, like, it, it's one of those, like, that wouldn't be ideal, obviously, but, you know, it, it's one of those where Calgary needed the player, and 
you know, Coleman was looking to cash in after winning back-to-back cups, so it was just a match made perfectly. And we'll see how it turns out, but uh, from the one game, uh, he looked well, and we'll see. Um, Especially, like, he's very much like the prototypical Daryl Sutter player. Uh, and, you know, like, if you could get, I'm sure if uh, Daryl could get, like, t- uh, 12 forwards that were all Blake Coleman, I think he would be in heaven. So, um, yeah, it, it's one of those where it both fit a need in terms of position, play style, overall, like, the two wayness for. Which will fit the cap. Yeah, it helps Kachuk or Lindholm uh, be a little bit more risky because he is so good defensively, or whomever he's with, and you know it just is a good stabilizing force for whatever line he's on. So, whichever way you manipulate it, it works out as a very big positive for this team. I agree. I'm excited to see what we get out of Coleman. Um, let's move on to the next one. The Calgary Flames make history, making the first trade with the Seattle Kraken, what, a day after the expansion draft? And they bring in Tyler Pitlick. They traded a 2022 second, four, sorry, fourth round pick to Seattle for Tyler Pitlick, who will be wearing number 18 here. For those that don't know, Tyler Pitlick's a little bit of a journeyman. He's played his first two seasons in Edmonton. Uh, then he went to Dallas, Philadelphia, and Arizona. And he's 29 years old, a right shot, listed as a centerman. Um, this is a guy that I think, like you said, a Daryl Sutter type player, but I think also a guy who's who can fill a couple roles here. I mean, Pitlick's not a huge checker, but he's a guy who I find is not afraid to go into the corners and play. You know, some of those uh, some of those corners and some of those uh, along the boards that other guys don't want to. And I think a good role player for this team. Yeah, like he very much uh, fits. Um like to use uh, Daryl Sutter's old team, um, like the role of like a, a Jordan Nolan or an Andre Andreoff or a Trevor Lewis, just that solid guy who can play a little physically, get in on the forecheck, create a little bit of havoc, and it, he can play center, he can play right wing, so the Flames, like that's a win-win because the Flames could use a center and a right wing, so... He'll be on the third or fourth line, and he'll be that 20-ish point, 25-point guy who plays responsible defensively. You won't really see a ton of offense from him, but, you know, just that solid, bigger body who can skate. His best season, points-wise, was uh, 2019-2020 in Philly, where he got 20 points in 63 games, and we've seen... Uh, Pitlick so far, uh, I think both of practices and I think that last game as well, uh, playing with Backlund and Dubé. And I like that pairing because I think Pitlick's a guy that can go in and move that puck. He can put it out for Dubé and Backlund to do something with. And like you said, also defensively responsible, which I think will pair well with Backlund if he ends up there. Yeah, because like if he, you know, like to harken back a couple of years, like if you have like Dubé playing Kachuk's role on that line, uh, Pitlick can easily play for Leak's role on that line, where just that heady two-way guy who can both take a pass and make a pass, but not be great at it, but a good foil for the other guys. Yeah, no, I I totally agree with that. I think um, I think Pitlick is definitely. Definitely a good foil for the other teams. And if you look at where he sits, just uh, we didn't sign this, but just so everyone's aware, he's got one more year in his deal at $1.75 million. So I'd say it may be a little expensive for where he's in the lineup, but it's not a deal that we signed. Yeah, and it's not a, a big deal. Like, realistically, like one and a half would probably be more right, but at that rate, 250000 is not like the end of the world for a player that's going to be on your third line. The next player the Flames brought in, they signed to a one-year $800,000 deal. He wore number 22 this year, and there's a player very familiar, Daryl Sutter. It's Trevor Lewis. Trevor Lewis is a 34-year-old right-shot centerman. He's played for the Kings his whole career, started in uh, 08 and played there right up until 2019-2020, uh, and then spent one year in Winnipeg last year. So I think this is really a depth signing. There's a guy who you know has been with Daryl, has a cup. 
he's coming in to be your locker room presence, I think, and I don't think you see Lewis play any higher than the fourth line. Yeah, uh, frankly, I view him as, uh, and uh, a, another signing, Brad Richardson, as uh, being like the fourth line center, and uh, when Brett Ritchie isn't playing, Lewis will play right wing on that line. One of those where each one of those guys is kind of flexible, so, you know. See, I think you'll probably see either Lewis or Richardson uh, as the 13th forward, and then they'll sort of rotate in and out with Richie if he makes the team, which I think he will. Yeah. It, uh, yeah, like, it. how would you say it? Having options is always a good thing, and, yeah, uh, like, if a player is playing better in practice, you, you know, and you want to give a boot to the other guy to get him going... You know, you could, you have that flexibility where you can swap parts out, which is good. And another guy you can play wing and center. He's a right shot. Uh, he's been playing right wing during some of this preseason so far, and he can also play center. But I think the big thing with Trevor Lewis is the veteran leadership he brings in. He's 34, but he's got, what, he's got two cops, right? Yeah, with L.A., yeah. So, so I think... Um, yeah, there's a guy who's got some experience, and I think that's really what he's being brought in for, is that experience. Yeah, and any time that you're bringing in guys who have been there and won Cups, like, especially with this team where, like, it, that was, like, my knock on Giordano was that, like, he wasn't there and had only gone to the playoffs, like, one or two times, and... Like, it's hard to be a captain of a team and lead... Uh, when like you don't, you don't know, know what, what you're takes. doing and yeah. which that's not on Giordano it's just circumstance and you know getting new guys in that have been there so that way they can yap on the bench when you know adversity happens that you know. on the bench you know on the plane in the hotel like they can be around I think especially if you have young guys you want those guys to sit next to them in the room and be there to help mentor them and yeah. So next time on the plane. Maybe Trevor Lewis will be our next captain. We're looking for one. He's got the experience. Yeah, I, I still think it's gonna be Lucic, but that's You another. gotta be a full you gotta be a full time roster member to be the captain. Yeah. Uh, um let's move on to the next one. First defenseman on the list. This was a big trade the Flames made. A lot of people surprised by it. Trading another 2022 pick, their 2022 third round pick this time, to Chicago for Nikita Zadorov, who they then signed to a one-year deal for $3.75 million. He'll be wearing jersey number 16 this year. A lot of interesting comments um, from Flames fans about Zadorov when he came in. Some people like the signing. Some people don't like the signing. Uh, Matt, what, what's your what's your thought on this one? I remember hearing the outcries of, "Oh, this is a wasted contract." When the Flames signed uh, Derek England a handful of years ago, and he was perhaps one of the best value for dollar contracts that the Flames had at that stage, and. The Flames, frankly, other than Derek England, have not really had a physically tough defenseman since Robin Regeer left. And, like, basically all of the, their defensemen have been that uh, slick two-way defenseman or the, uh, I'm just out here and hopefully they, they don't score while I'm out here type guys. There's not really been anybody who you look at and go, oh, I'm scared to go up that guy's side of the ice. And that's been a huge thing, uh, I think, that's been missing in the recipe for the Flames, is just having that guy that, you know, if you go and touch our goalie, he will send you into the boards, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I mean, Regeer, like you said, comes to mind. Fanuf comes to mind as former Flames that did that. Yeah, and, like, the Flames, for whatever reason, over the last decade, other than Derek England, really haven't had that guy. And... You know, so getting Zadorov, yeah, he takes too many penalties, but, you know... I, We're used to that. Sam Bennett's gone. Someone has to take those penalty minutes. Exactly, you know, and I'd rather, you know, the player giving taking the penalties be bruising the other guys by hitting them than taking chintzy hooking calls like a certain player that's no longer here. 
You know what, though? We've seen Zadorov's penalty minutes go down. I mean, if we look at his stats in 2017-2018, uh, he played 77 games, got 103 penalty minutes. Um, since he, you know, his last year in Colorado, he played 64 games and only had 65 penalty minutes. So let's just round it down to a minute a game. And uh, last year in Chicago, 55 games, 36 penalty minutes. So I feel like he's matured into a player that can, as you said, be that physical presence. But I think he's also learning how to play a little bit smarter. Yeah. And you could tell, like, um, at, at times that he kind of had that swagger um, of, well, that's your problem <laughs> when he would go over that line. And he's learned over the years that, you know, like he's actually being detrimental to his team by doing that. And I'm hoping that that maturity, like with him signing the one year deal, I think that's just a hedge for both him and us. Um, because I think that both the Flames and the, the player want him to be here for a number of years. But it's kind of like, well, what exactly are you? And it's hard to, like, say, sign him to, a, like, a five-year deal at three and a half or whatever if he's not that caliber of player. Okay. And it's kind of a, well, let's see what you actually do with us. And we're interested, but we got to see. And, and I think... Daryl Sutter can maybe get him, and Daryl Staff, I should say, not just Daryl, but Daryl Staff can maybe get him to play a little uh, more intelligently and not be in the box as much. But I think that's a big part of it, too, is can you play a different type of game? Are you coachable in that way or not? Yeah. Well, like I, I actually was hoping back when uh, the, the draft happened that he would have fallen to when the Flames picked, um, I think it was Klimchuk or Poirier, one or the other, I think that was the right draft, but um, it just didn't turn out that way. And um, that was the Sean Monahan draft. He was actually yeah. uh, he was taken he was taken sixteenth, and we took Monahan at sixth. Yeah, I was hoping that he'd fall to like twenty one or twenty three or whatever. And then our twenty second pick was yeah. Emil Poirier, and then Morgan Klimchuk. Yeah, I was hoping he'd fall to that range, but Buffalo scooped him, and you know uh, I've liked Zadorov. It's just that he's been a work in progress, and it's looking like that work in progress is actually coming to fruition, and hopefully he can be that good defensive banger-type defenseman that this team's lacked. And, like, I'm actually looking forward to him playing on the second pairing with Anderson, because I think that might actually help Anderson utilize his offensive skills a little bit more. I think... The question to me is if Zadorov can be a top four guy on a good team or if he's going to be an overpaid 5-6. And I think he's going to get the option to be in the top four here because, you know, that's what they're paying him for and that's where they've got a hole. But I think this year's really going to tell if that's in his cards or not. Well, I think that, like, frankly, like, it, you know, if I was in True Living Shoes, with Giordano departing, I'd be basically saying to everybody other than Tanev, that, well, captain's gone. All the spots are open. You know, you guys, there's X number of you. Sort it out. You know, yeah. if you want the number one spot on the roster, go take it. You know, go be better than Hannafin. Or, you mm -hmm. know, if you want to be the, the second pairing guy, well, you got to be better than Valimaki or Shillington or, 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 or. Mm -hmm. And... You know, I think that this will be helpful in terms of this team transitioning forward, that it'll allow the players to actually sort themselves out and not be like, okay, well, Giordano's number one, and then Tanev's number two, and then, you know, we kind of already have the rest of everything filled out, so there's not really any actual competition. This time, there's actual competition, and I think that'll yield better results. I agree. And Zadorov's 26. I mean, you know, that's kind of the when a lot of defensemen enter their peak. So I think this season and maybe next season will really determine if this guy can take that step up to be an NHL number four or if he's sort of your five, six, and a four on a bad team. Yeah. And it's one so, of those things that um, because of his age, like he's at that right 
stage where if like he is looking like a good piece like you can re-sign him for four or five six years and have him as like the stalwart second pairing defensive banger type guy that just anchors that pairing yeah and you can probably get a decent deal on him too at 26 i don't know if i'd go four years on him but i think two or three yeah. We'll see how he does this year, but I think two or three might be good just to get him. I wouldn't bring him in past 30. I don't know how much longevity he's got. Yeah, it's one of those that you might have to give a little, sort of like Coleman. And, and I don't know what guys like um, Valimaki might do. I mean, you don't want to sign him too much where then, you know, Valimaki can't progress up the up the lineup. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and for sure. And I, that's why I think the flexibility with the one year helps a lot as well. So we'll see. Let's go now to a goaltender. Uh, the the goaltender the Flames brought in. We'd wondered going into this who will be the backup next year with Riddick gone. Riddick did not resign here in the offseason. I heard some people think that he might. Uh, instead, the Calgary Flames go out and and uh, make yet another trade, another 2022 third round pick. They trade to the Boston Bruins to bring in Dan Vlader. Dan Vlader, I've heard it pronounced a few ways. Uh, number 80. He'll be wearing on the team from the Czech Republic. This is a guy who has five NHL games to his name. He's played mostly in the AHL and ECHL. Um, looks like he's going to be our backup. What do you think of this as our backup goaltender, Matt? Um, he's a large goalie in the same manner that Markstrom is. Um, Twenty-four years old, six foot five, hundred eighty-five pounds. Yeah, you know, so like that's. Oh no, sorry, six foot and a half. My bad. Um, you know, like him. Uh, being a larger goalie that helps um we'll see it, it like that's where i was looking especially at his like footwork and that and he seemed to be a little henrik carlson-esque but not quite to that extent and he just has to get reps in at the nhl level to see what he is well, and I think that's the interesting discussion is the whole question of reps. As a 24-year-old goaltender, he's a guy who needs to play NHL games to get better. How many games are you going to play with you know, the starter that's in front of him? And when he does play, is the team going to be confident in him? And if they lose that confidence, I mean, you've really not got a lot of other options here. I don't know if this is the way I would have gone for a backup. I probably would have gone with a veteran guy this year. And I think a guy like uh, Vlader really needs to be on a team where he's going to get more ice time. Well, I, I frankly think that the Flames will probably end up playing Vladar about 25-ish games. Um, maybe 30. Um, so, like, I don't see him being, like, a McElhenney 8-10 game type backup. Um, but it's one of those situations where because Wolf is so young and like he's just entering the AHL that like there's no interstitial step uh, between Markstrom and uh, Wolf so uh, I think Vladar is like that good uh, enough prospect yet like also NHL goalie to fit in that general zone and, you know, because goalies are weird, frankly, you don't really know if Ladar might be more than. And learning from a guy like Markstrom, who has a very similar profile, uh, I think that'll help him on, like, how to position himself and, like, how to make those reactionary saves and, 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 and. I was wrong. Vladar is 6'5", and Markstrom's 6'6", six, six. so like you said, he could learn from another very tall goaltender as well. I think Markstrom's a great guy to learn from. I just don't know that at 20 games, he's going to have enough time to really develop. Well, you also have to figure, like, there's always the practices, the working with the two goalie coaches, and, you know, like, there's going to be lots of input, and, you know... Like, I would assume that, he, you know, I, at this point, uh, because of the fact that the Flames are kind of in a possible transition slash rebuild slash trying to be competitive, um, that it's one of those where you kind of have to try to build for the future while trying to be competitive. And, like, I think Vladar is kind of that good enough, but not, but, yeah, kind of guys 
And I guess when I look at some of the other goaltenders that were available and they got backup jobs, there's other guys I looked at and went, ah, I'd rather have that guy or I'd rather have that guy. Yeah, it's one of those where, like, I think for the long term, it's better to go with Vladar. But I don't know, you know, like, yeah, we could have signed, a, like, a guy like Brassois or... But again, how long term is long term? I think if you think that Dustin Wolf is the future of this team, is Vladar the guy to bridge that gap? Well, it, like, assume that like worst case scenario happens where like the team kind of just implodes on itself, and like we we you know trade Gaudreau, trade Kachuk, and like go rebuild fully, um, and like more of a teardown thing. A guy like Vladar you know, as a, a quasi starter on a really bad team, that's perfect. You know, like he, he would do a good enough job where it's like, okay, sure. And like, I would assume that you'd like try to trade marks from as well. If like the flames go like right down. <clears throat> there are 750,000 this year and next year. Not a bad deal. What this reminds me of when we look at this pairing of Markstrom and Vladar, and tell me if you feel the same, is almost like back in the 90s when you had those starter goaltenders like Cujo or Hashik, and nobody knew who their backup was. Or even Kipper half the time. I mean, they just had some random backup who was good enough for 20 games, and this feels very reminiscent of that. Yeah, um... I think uh, Vladar has more potential to be... I think he has more potential, but we don't know if he'll reach it yeah. 20 games a year. I know. It's one of those that, uh, with that whole backup position, it's kind of a giant question mark. I mean, you could even say the same, but when Hashik was in uh, Buffalo being backed up by Marty Baron, right? Nobody knew who he was. He had potential, and he came out later. I just don't know that... I guess if we're looking at it, if you're right. If they think he's got potential and he can recognize that potential playing 20 games a year, this could be a good signing. But if he's just kind of a filler piece, I think that there was better veteran guys that they could have brought in there. Yeah, and apparently like they were looking at trying to acquire him for two years, so like they've clearly been... They've wanted him. Yeah, so it's one of those where goalies are kind of voodoo and hey you know for a third round pick for a 23 year old goalie with size not the worst gamble and you know like if the flames are finding him lacking and need like a veteran guy at say the trade deadline you could always get one for very little because they don't go for much well, and as you said, too, he's a, he's a young goalie with size. I think if you do have to move on from him, there will be a buyer for that. Everybody likes to have a young goalie with size in their system. Yeah. Um, well, let's talk about the other goaltender with size they brought in. Another young goaltender with size, and that's Adam Werner. Adam Werner, um, another six foot five goaltender. He's a little bit heavier at 198. He's a uh, right-handed goaltender. He last played in the Chicago Avalanche organization. He's only played two NHL games for the Avalanche, and that was in 2019-2020. And he's the guy who right now is, uh, I wouldn't say backing up later in the preseason, but he's, I guess, um, the number two. He's going to wear number 30 for the Flames. Warner is pretty much destined for uh, the AHL at this point, isn't he, Matt? Yeah, uh, I would assume so. I think he's going to be sort of the veteran presence to uh, Dustin Wolf. Yeah. So, uh, and another interesting signing, another big goaltender. I think really, either of these guys could take off. I mean, you know, v- Vlader uh, isn't waiver eligible, um, but I think that Warner, Warner could surprise. I think and end up being the, I guess, the backup of the future, if you will. I don't think he's ever going to be a starter yeah. for the Flames, but I think he could get more reps into the AHL and start to, um, same age, I, I, I just think he could be the guy who ends up next year being the backup. It's possible, and it's one of those with young goalies. Uh, like I'm always a fan of getting guys that are showing respectably at the AHL level that are about that age, because you never know. Uh, like, Kipper came out of the woodwork, and... Mm-hmm. You know, unexpectedly and was awesome. Yeah, we got to remember, Kipper was a third stringer when we got him. Yeah. Brought in to back up Turek, not to start. <clears throat> yeah, and he was just an injury fill-in because uh, McLennan got hurt while Turek was already injured, and then, you know, they just needed a body at that point. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, you'll do, I guess. <laughs> and, I, and I think you might see Warner, if they can, cycle him up to Calgary if there's an opportunity. Um 
there, Treliving had a was asked at the last press conference, um, "What happens? Are we going to have a taxi squad this year? Because we have guys in Stockton, and how are we going to get guys up here quickly if we need them with quarantine?" And he was kind of cagey on it, but. I would not be surprised to see this team actually carry Warner as a third uh, goaltender. Yeah, quite possible. I think that, you know, should you need a backup, you don't necessarily want to have to wait two weeks to get a guy in here. So I could see there being some, or I could maybe see him loan to one of the Canadian AHL teams so that he'd be easier to access. That's possible too. Um, they've got so many defensemen now that I, I think you, you've got some, or not defensemen, they've got so many goalies um, ready for Stockton that I think you've got some options there. Yeah. Another signing here, a signing that surprised me when I heard it, another veteran guy. This is another you know guy that they're bringing in for veteran presence. Left shot, right winger um, from Belleville, Ontario, 36 years old, Brad Richardson, a name that's been around the league forever. He's played in Colorado, L.A., Vancouver, Arizona, and last year, Nashville. Um, anything more to say here, really, besides a depth fill-in? This is your Toby Reader of this year, but he got a contract instead of a tryout? Well, I've liked Brad Richardson pretty much since he was with Colorado to start his career, and he's just one of those really good defensive forwards who does his job well. It, it, it's sort of like Derek Ryan, but, you know, less offense. I, th- I think I think Richards will probably, or Richardson will probably end up being um, your... 12-13 guy. Yeah, I was going to say maybe even your 13-14. I don't know if he'll be, have a regular spot in the lineup, but if there's a guy who's going to sit in the press box, I'd rather it's a 36-year-old than a guy who needs the play time. Yeah, I can see that. So I, I think this is, a, again, a veteran presence. We've said that a few times now. A guy who's been around the league since 05, 06. A guy who knows what it takes to win. A guy who has some playoff experience. He has 61 playoff games. And a guy who I think can come in and play. I I mean, he's not... Yeah, I think Derek Ryan's a good uh, comparison. But I think a guy who's going to be in the penalty box more than Ryan was. I think yeah. a grittier um, guy. Yeah, I, I view him as kind of... Um... Just one of those good uh, filler, sort of like a Stefan Yell. He can do a little bit of everything. Yeah, like he's not great at any one thing, but he just does everything proper that you ask of him. Mm-hmm. And I think that like with uh, the different makeups of like guys like Pitt, like Richardson, uh, Lewis, and Richie, like they're different styles of players, and so I think you can kind of tailor your lineup to the opponent a bit like if you're playing more of a run and gun young team like say a Detroit Red Wings um you can go with guys that have a little bit more foot speed like uh Richardson than you would necessarily like Trevor Lewis and you know you can switch things out according to where like where if you got like a team that like LA that's more of a heavy team you're going to want, like, Richie in there to throw his weight around. I think also over an 82-game schedule, it gives you a little more veteran depth always in the lineup because I don't think all those guys are going to play on most given nights. No. But it lets you bring one of them in, one of them out. I think it lets you always have some some veteran depth. And I, I think, you know, those guys that are going to be looked at to throw the body around, I think you want those to be some of your older guys. You don't necessarily want your younger guys doing that. Let the old guys go in and do some of that and let the young guys play their game. Yeah. Because, uh, exactly, like, I wouldn't want Dubé throwing his weight around, you yeah. know. No, I agree. So, I think, you know, those guys, I hate to say it, but they're kind of your cannon fodder in a way. Um, and, and I think, you know, again, Richardson, I have no doubt, any night you put Richardson in the lineup, he will do an adequate job for where he is. Yeah, exactly. And I, I you think you can pretty much say that about Pitlick, Lewis, Richie, Lucic. Like, I think Pitlick will probably be a regular in the lineup. I yeah. don't think, I think oh, I Lewis agree. and... And Richardson will tag out. Yeah, and I think that, like, Richie and possibly Lucic, you know, like, it depends, but... Well, know. if they're going to put the C on Luch, I think he'll be in there every night. Yeah, we'll see. Like, it, there's a lot... It's... There's a lot of permutations, and, you know, we just have to see how, like, day one, how the team is, and go from there. And the last... Uh... 
the last signing that we'll spend some time talking about. It's been almost an hour now talking about new guys, and we have some other things to talk about. Is another surprise, or at least it was for me, Eric Good Branson coming in, a right shot defenseman. Um, Flames fans probably know him from his time from uh, 2016 through 2019 with Vancouver. 29 year old defenseman. He came in for a one year deal for just under two million dollars. Neil wore number 44 this year. What did you think about them bringing in Good Branson? Well, I think that most people's complaint. <clears throat> was that, oh, he's getting $2 million, and, like, why? You know, and realistically, yeah, I can understand that, but it really doesn't make much of a difference because it's just a one-year deal. You can say if he was on a three-year at that, I could see it, but yeah. he's on a one-year and we got the cap room. Exactly, and, you know... Considering his cap last year was... Or his cap hit last year was $4 million. Yeah, like, it, frankly... Like, this team, like, as I was mentioning with Zadorov, we haven't had, like, a true thug on the blue line since Derek England and then before that, Regeer. Good Branson, like, yeah, he's not very good defensively. Yeah, he's kind of mediocre generally. You're only going to be playing them, that player, against the teams that have a lot of big forwards. Because you don't want Shillington having to deal with a six foot five forward, like you just don't, because that guy's going to get muscled off. You're going to want somebody who can, you know, you're pushing me, I'll push you right back. And you know, as much as like size shouldn't matter, it still does in the NHL. And um, Good Branson is basically going to be playing those games as the number six defenseman when the Flames are playing those big teams that have those big bruising forwards, which there are a few. There's not that many, but there's a few. And I'm sure that those will be the games he plays. And like everybody else, it'll be either Shillington or Stone or whomever, Mackey. You always need extra defensive bodies. And like I said with, you know, Richardson, I would rather have a seven or eight who knows what they're doing. I mean, Gabranson has been around the league for almost 14 years to step in and you know you'll get him, you'll get an adequate performance out of him rather than putting a guy like uh, Connor Mackey sitting on the bench for most of the season. That's just my thought. So I think he's good for that. And I think he's a good fill-in guy. I think you could, you know, if we lose, let's say we lose Valimaki or we lose Zadorov for five games, I feel confident enough that you know he can come in and fill for five six games and he's not gonna be a defensive liability yeah like he'll be adequate and that's really all that the team needs is him to be adequate overpaid probably but you know it's only one year yeah and i don't see him coming back next year no like this is literally a one year hey we need a thug and you're it and you know, and I don't even know if he'll be looked at as a thug. I can see him taking a lot of time with Valimaki, sort of being the veteran there and being the guy who's being looked at to sort of you know shoulder a little bit more of the defensive load and let Valimaki try to be a little more of a two way defender and, and get some offense in. Yeah, I can see that. I also think that there might be a negative, more negative feeling toward Good Branson because he was a Canuck. Like that tends to happen when we bring in a guy who is an Oiler or a Canuck. People tend to hate them a little bit more. Well, I hate him because he was a Panther. <laughs> so, you know, waste of a draft pick on that one. But anyhow. <laughs> um, there's a few other guys we won't talk about. Let's just quickly go through the re-signings for this year, the players that got brought back in. Oliver Shillington, Tyler Parsons, uh, Connor Pullman, Matthew Philp, or Ma- sorry, Matthew Phillips, Luke Philp, uh, Michael Stone, Connor Mackey, uh, Dylan Dubé got re-signed. That's really about it. Yeah. So no... Nobody there that were you, you know, surprised left. that Michael Stone came back? You and I have said this, right? He's like the cat that came back, right? We pay him to go away and we bring him back. Like, and you know, to be fair to Stone, he had a really good season last year. He didn't play until February, and when he did come in, I think he played well enough to get a job. Yeah, I agree. And at the cost we're paying him, I mean, if they have to, you could probably wave him and send him to Stockton. Yeah, like worst case scenario, and even then, like you know. The way I look at Good Branson and Stone, it's kind of like doing your deadline day shopping for your depth defenseman before the season starts. Cause you know, Stone might get claimed at 800. Nobody's touching Good Branson at 195, so you might be able to sneak that one through waivers if you did want a, a veteran down there. Yeah, but even then, I, I think that 
you know, just as a 7-8 guy, I think both those guys are perfectly valid. And, yeah, we'll see. Um, and then three players that we lost of significance. Zach Ronaldo got signed by Columbus. He just got waived today and is likely going to be terminated because he hasn't got vaccinated and won't report to camp. Uh, Artem Zagadulin left as a UFA. I'm a little surprised about that one, but seeing, you know, sort of the Flames backfilling goaltenders, it's not going to matter that much. And Dominique Simone goes back to Pittsburgh. So any of those guys surprise you? Uh, kind of disappointed about Zags leaving, but, you know, you that's the thing with goalies. You try them. If they work out, great. If they don't, you know, like at least you tried. And he played adequately in Stockton and he just never took that next step like Riddick did and you know move on to new people and we'll see he's the latest in a long line of European goaltenders that don't work out for the Flames yep so Matt with these additions that we've talked about would you say that we're better worse or about the same from where we were in the season ended last year as an overall roster I think that the team's actually significantly better. Significantly, okay. Uh, because of the fact that basically the Flames replaced four forwards uh, at the NHL level with players that are actually NHL forwards. And I think that that makes a huge difference. Uh, I think that, you know, the cycling in of the guys like Levo, Simon and all the other filler guys that just were terrible was a good portion of why the Flames missed the playoffs because like they were just bad and it dragged every line down. And not to blame, like, other players needed to step up, like Monaghan, like Kachuk, and, like, they didn't pull their weight. But it's hard to do everything yourself. And you need to have three players that are competent on offensive lines. And when, you know, you had Gaudreau, Monaghan, and insert miscellaneous non-NHL player, the defense just has to look at, does Monaghan have the puck? Does Gaudreau have the puck? If yes, then target them. If the other guy has the puck, who cares? Cover Monaghan and Gaudreau. And, you know, like, it just makes the opponent's jobs really easy, and it makes the other guy's jobs really hard and so the fact that you have guys like Majapane now who's a quality player with Monaghan and Gaudreau you have Coleman who's a quality player with Kachuk and Lindholm you have Pitlick who is a decent enough foil for Dubé and Backlund like those are actual NHL players and you know like that makes a huge difference losing Giordano does hurt the team but you know, he is not going to be as good as he was last year because he is going to be 39. Like, it, it, that eventually defensemen, like, whether it's the Dano Chara, Dan Boyle, Duncan Everybody Keith, slows down. yeah, like, you, there's a season where you just hit that wall and you go from being that top pairing guy to being the third pairing guy. And it might not be this year, it might be next year, but either way, Giordano's hitting that. Age out. I think Giordano will probably be higher in the lineup by necessity. Yeah, I agree. In, uh, in Seattle than we might have here. Yeah, and I think that uh, by creating that black hole uh, where, okay, we don't have the guy, it gives, we have like five really good young defensemen. It throws the gauntlet down to each of them. The job is yours if you take it. When we brought in Hannafin, I don't know if you remember, I told you, this is the guy they're bringing in as the heir apparent to Mark Giordano. Yeah, I agree. And at the time, I was in full agreement. And now it's time for him to put up. Yep. And he did last year. He was probably the Flames' best defenseman last year. And, you know, he needs to keep going. But, you know, guys like Valimaki, like Shillington, like Anderson, like Mackey, they all need to show that they have more as well. And, you know, like Shillington needs to show that he can be a full-time NHLer. And, you know, like if he plays like he did in the one preseason game and it keeps that up, he will earn that spot. But, you know, everybody needs to show that there's more there. And then when the season starts show that there's more there and keep showing that there's more there 
And, you know, the season will be largely determined on whether or not those guys can rise to the occasion or not. And that'll be a good indication of, do you need to go and do, like, what the Oilers did, which is go and get that veteran guy to anchor the second, third pairing? Or, you know, are they working? If yes, then, hey, you're great, and who cares? You know, that problem solves itself. So on paper, you think this lineup looks, as you said, significantly better than last year? Yeah, it, basically because the whole forward group was completely disjointed for basically the whole season, and it made everything... Like, the only line that was relatively consistent was the Kachuk, uh, Lindholm, and Mangiapane line because you had three actual good players on that line. Every other line was completely weighted to the left and center side which makes it very easy for the opponents to defend against and now that the Flames have that proper balance where you actually have NHLers at all 12 positions you know you're actually going to have a lineup that you can actually roll the lines and they'll actually be effective each component of those lines will be effective where everything was kind of all over the place last year I'm going to go in a different direction. I think that this lineup, I wouldn't say looks worse than last year, but I don't think it looks as strong as I hoped it would. I think yeah, I the agree Cameron addition is definitely great. I think they're still missing a top, nine. let's call it top nine yeah, right winger. I agree. And, and I think that the defense, there's something to be desired. Like I said, I don't know that Zadorov is a, the guy I would look at as a top four if we're going to go deep. I think he's going to be good enough for one year, but it still feels like we're missing a piece there and we need to do, you know, things by committee. I think on the D on the goaltending side, I think, uh, Vladder could be good down the road, but I think we'll be at a, a bit of a, a wild card compared to Riddick, who we know it feels not like we're missing something. It feels like the flames yeah, were setting up for something that didn't happen, whether that's Eichel or something else. It feels like it just felt like we're missing something. Yeah. And, to some extent, like I, I agree with that. Um, I'm also basing like my opinion of like are they better or worse or whatever based on the fact that they missed the playoffs in the easiest division in the NHL last season. And, sure, and that's where you know, like on pa- okay, well, on paper, they are yeah. worse, probably just in terms of name recognition. You know, because losing Giordano and, and Riddick is a blow. But I think I think they got think, better at forward but marginally. I think that Coleman's an upgrade. I don't know. I mean Lewis and Richardson could do just as poorly as, you know, the guys we had last year. We don't know. I, um, but I, I'm gonna add a caveat to that where if those guys falter like the all of the guys did last year, all of the prospects that were too young last year to come up are now like Pospisil is ready. Um, Rajitska is ready. Um, Phillips could play depending on if like a top nine injury happens. So like, you know, like there are actual feasibilities of young guys taking spots if the veteran guys don't turn out. Whereas last year it was, yeah, this is what we got and good, you know, good to go. Yeah. 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 I mean, I I like the veteran depth. I like that they've gone with vets like Richardson, Lewis, um, Good Branson. I I like veteran guys plugging those holes. But it just it, it feels like it feels like the roster's incomplete. Yeah. And how do you say? Um, like this team. Like when I've been overly optimistic at times. Like I. Which is always, every season. It it's. Because I look at the overall talent level of the good players on the team, and like there's enough talent there where they should be a good team. It's just that they're continually being hamstrung by weird things like, you know, bad coaching, or you know, not having proper balance to lines, or 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 you know like there's been a whole ever since the one season where everything actually did work properly and they did finish first in the west you know like ever since then it's been like you know things just being weird frankly for the team and i think that you know like if 
like, say Manjapani and Dubé take their next step, which they looked like at the end of last season like they were going to, then, you know, like, now you've got, like, six top nine forwards that are all really good. You know, and you have depth stretching throughout the lineup. Now, things could go the other way, where, like, if Monaghan continues to struggle... If Backlund regresses, if, 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 like, this team could be a bottom five team, they could also be a top ten, top eight team if things go the other way because our division is terrible. So, like... I think you used the word earlier as opportunity, and I think that might be the way to look at it this year. I think Dubé's got opportunity. A lot of our young defensemen have opportunity. A lot of our young guys in the farm might have an opportunity. Um, but I, I think... My worry, especially when I look at the forward core, like let's start at the forwards first. We've got our top nine locked up, locked up Kachuk, Lindholm, Coleman, Goudreau, Monaghan, Mangiapane, um, and then arguably your seventh is Backland. And if one of those top six gets hurt, I'm not comfortable yet with Dubé or Pitlick filling in long term. We know that Backland hasn't done uh, well on the wing. I would be actually with Dubé. Okay, I'm not quite yet. Um, it, it would again. It would depend well, on like how long and who. Like yeah, we'll agree to disagree on that one. But I think Dubé needs a little bit of work still. So I guess to me, there's a very distinct difference between a top six and the bottom six. It's lessening. Yeah. Um, but I I think it's there, and, and I like. I like the depth, though. Like, I, I feel more confident with Dubé, Backlund, Pitlick, let's say Lewis Richardson and Lucic as the depth than I did in the past two or three seasons. Yeah, and, the, like, I think that, like, if you look back to the season where they actually were successful, like, they were able to actually roll lines and, like, all of the players on the lineup were contributing. Mm-hmm. And, like top right down and you know like that's where they were successful because they were getting contributions from everybody and like this lineup looks the most complete since then i think this is the first lineup to me too that has an identity like this looks like a daryl sutter team yeah exactly and this looks like the kind of team daryl would have put together when he was the gm yeah and i think that like uh, one of the problems on the blue line uh, frankly has been lack of foot speed and so getting some guys that are a little bit more mobile back there also helps um like um you know like having if Shillington and Balamaki can cement themselves um you know like Anderson looks a little faster this year I think he really focused on his skating in the off season you know like if those things can improve I think that that'll help as well it's one of those that, like, this team, they could be either really good, really bad, or right down the middle. And, you know, it, because of our division, like, it's basically Vegas, us, and Edmonton. Well, that's been the case for a couple of years. Oh, I know. We still, we still haven't done Oh, I well. know. And, like, hell, last year, like, the Flames missing the playoffs was as embarrassing as the Colorado loss, in my opinion. And I guess the question is, are they a good Pacific Division team, or are they a good team? Like, are they going to get it out of the Pacific Division and get annihilated? Well, it's one of those where uh, I think that this team would be, like, if they do make the playoffs, like, they're they're the team that I wouldn't want to face because of all the bangers on the team. So, you know, and, like, that style of team tends to do better than necessarily the talent level, like L.A. winning the Cup as the 6th and 8th seed. Whether, like, it, it, it's one of those where, like, it, honestly, this team, they have it in them to be successful. But they, but have, they have to actually do it, which they haven't shown that they can do it even though, like, the raw components are there for them to do mm-hmm. it. And, like, that's where, like, the frustration, like, especially in my case, of, like, because, like, they should have been up there with Toronto last year. But everything between the coaching, injuries, like, every little thing that could have went wrong did. That's not an excuse, but this team is well, very well- frustrating. We'll talk more about how they'll look in the season as we get close to the season. How about that? Yeah, Let's get I agree. Preseason first. Yeah, I agree. 
Um, and let's just talk about, now that we've talked about the guys who are here, let's talk some uh, training camp news and notes. An interesting name not at camp is Tyler Parsons. He did not report to camp. The GM said that uh, he could not satisfy quarantine requirements, which I don't want to speculate, but if I read between the lines, that tells me he didn't want to get vaccinated. Yeah. Um, Parsons not being at camp with Warner coming in with... um, with uh, Wolf here, and if we look at some of the names that are down in the AHL, it feels like, I mean, you you got to respect people's choices to a certain extent, but it feels like there's a bad time in his career to make that choice because it feels like that could be the end of his professional career. The Flames, I think, have enough goaltenders to backfill around him. Yeah. And I, I just, I, I think that could be the end of his pro career in North America. Yeah, it's one of those where, you know, like if, your paycheck depends on like you being vaccinated and like your whole future depends on that you know like even if you're reticent about vaccinations you know it's like um you should do it anyway if you want to have any actual aspirations or basically your entire life to this point has been kind of pointless you know because like you've just flushed your whole hockey career down the toilet like, I mean, it, he's just does, it. The logic behind what he's doing to me makes no sense whatsoever. But you know, to each their own. You know, you, you can't really argue. You know, you just. I mean, it just on. it felt like you know if he wants to be an, and we've seen him jump between the AHL and the ECHL, which I mean, you know, you're still playing pro hockey, great, but. With Wolf coming in, with, uh, you know, Adam Warner going down, I mean, that's your AHL team right there, your tandem. They've got a couple guys down in Stockton already with uh, Andrew Shortridge and I think Adam Evanoff is coming back. So there's your ECHL team. Like, it just seems like, you know, Parsons has probably at this point lost his chance. Yeah. And, you know, it's one of those that it's unfortunate because he's a very talented goaltender, but he couldn't really get out of his own way and 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 it's not like the flames just giving up on him i think you know not if if this is the case that he's not vaccinated i think not a lot of other teams are going to want to touch him either so your option is going to be you know find some echl team who really needs you or see if you can go go play in europe yeah like that's basically it and, and, you know, I, I mean, I bet you'll find some team that would bring him in because there's i think there's some echl divisions that are only um only American or primarily American schedules. So you might be able to get someone who would do that. And I think even, uh, what is it, Bertuzzi in Detroit? Has yeah. he just going to sit out the Canadian games? Yeah. But I think at the ECHL with their budgets, you don't want to pay a guy to sit out if you're playing Canada. So, I don't know. I mean, yeah. he's still under Flames contract. He'll probably be around unless they end up suspending him. But I just feel like at this point now, you're just waiting out that contract. Yeah. I think that's very much the case. And I think that as soon as it expires, that... Yeah, you just move on and. I mean, you and I had kind of already resigned to the fact that he's probably not going to make the NHL, but yeah. he might end up, you know, being. I thought he could be a decent serviceable, and there's always a couple guys that make a living. I mean, Joy McDonald comes to mind who make a living as an AHL goaltender, and I thought he could be one. I mean, he's had some demons in the past. He had a year he was off because of mental health issues and things like that. So he's had some demons that probably yeah. already set him back. Uh, but I know. And I think he's this probably definitely going down the road of like Daniel Ryder from eons ago. Wow. There's a name I haven't heard in a while. You know, and just kind of going off the rails. And well, he, I'd even say like an Emile Poirier, right? Who had a year of some mental health issues. And I think that was Poirier. Yeah. Didn't he get suspended? Yeah, he got suspended for a year because of mental health issues. Um, so, yeah, I, I just... I th- It's too bad for Tyler. I mean, you got to respect his opinion, but I feel like his opinion could be the death nail in an already shaky career. Yeah. Yep. And, and, es- and especially when you look at who they've re-signed him with. I mean, if I had to put money on, you know, um, Tyler Parsons or Adam Warner being... A better fit long term i'd go warner yeah oh at this rate you know like uh insert miscellaneous new guy like even uh chechelov like i'd i at this point i'd rather see him play just because 
he's new and different because that's true too. Yeah, Chechilov is expected to come over this year, I think. So yeah. I mean, he'll probably end up with ECHL minutes unless they run three guys in the A. The other note today is Calgary released ten guys from their or not released, but um, yeah, I guess some of them got released. Sent down ten guys from their camp. Forwards Alice Gallant, Mark Simpson, E22 Lola, Dmitry Zavgorodny have been assigned to Stockton, as has defenseman Jan Kuznetsov and Ilya Soliev, as well as goaltender Matt Greenfield. There's another goaltender name that I didn't even know was a goaltender. Any of those guys surprise you that they got sent no, down? Not really. Like the younger guys, they need to cut their teeth in the A and. Tula and, and Zev need Garodny just something. need AHL minutes. Yeah, they need to show something. Yeah, and Gal- I don't. And Mark Simpson. I mean, him, um, Greenfield, not NHL names. Galant's had some NHL time, but he's he was destined. If you look at our roster, to be an NHL player this year. Yeah. And then forwards Luke Philp and defenseman Colton Pullman have been placed on waivers. If they clear, they'll also be assigned to the Heat. I don't see why they wouldn't. I think everybody has a Those player guys, like yeah. Philp and Pullman, so I don't think anyone takes them. Yeah. Like, they're and not defenseman... showing enough to go, oh, I must claim this guy. No, so. for sure. That's it. Otherwise, and, and they'd I don't... still be here. <laughs> yeah, that's it. If they were good enough, they're young enough, you could you know, trade them for something if you're worried about it. And even if they do get traded, it's not going to end up being, a, you know, a Byron who ends up doing something somewhere else. And then the last guy was Jeremy Poirier. He's been assigned to the QMJHL St. John Sea Dogs. And I think, again, that was logical. He's too young to play in the A, and there's no room for him on our blue line this year. Yeah. And he needs to improve defensively and all that kind of stuff, so... Yeah, we'll see in next year how he does and if he's improved and all that kind of stuff. My next question for you is if we look at the blue line right now for the Flames, um, where do you think that Shillington fits into it? We saw Shillington sort of as our number seven for part of the season last year. And if we look at the guys that we've got there, I mean, you've got Anderson above him, uh, Hannafin above him, um, you know, Tanev above him, Valimaki probably above him, Zadorov above him. Really, I think it comes down to, is he better than Good Branson and Stone? Yeah, and that's where, like, it's on him, frankly. Like, um, it, it, he just has to come into the... Uh, training camp and just play his heart out and in the first game he did that great awesome check mark number one go do it again and that's all he has to keep doing if he plays like he did in that game he will have a spot in the opening lineup he's 24 Connor yeah like Connor Mackey's 25 if you had to keep one of them who would you keep uh Shillington up here Shillington easily I agree um Shillington's reminded me a lot of TJ Brody, uh, and you know, like it took Brody till he was 23, 24, 25, really, to start figuring out the game at the NHL level. And like his first seasons were bad defensively. Like he was like, "What are you doing?" Level bad. He eventually figured it out and became a really good top pairing defenseman. Shillington. If he can figure out the defense, like all of, like that's part of what's been so enticing about Shillington, is he has the good offensive skills and the instincts of when to jump up and when not to, and all that. Like he can be a good 30, 40 point defenseman if he can learn how to do the whole defense part of it. And he hasn't really been able to show that he can at this point. But if he can, then, you know he'll start to unlock that potential and start, you know, being looked at as a serviceable, at least top six, potentially top four defenseman. And, you know, you just have to see where that kind of thing goes. And, you know, he has a microcosm of the flames. He has the tools, but he hasn't shown that he knows how to use them. I think his big problem last year was consistency. Yeah, exactly. And I guess then the question is, you're not going to carry nine defensemen unless we get some sort of re- reserve system come in this year. Yeah. So if Shillington stays, either Good Branson or Stone, in my mind, has to go somewhere else. What do you do? Um, 
it would be then up to whether Stone or uh, Good Branson, which of those two is playing better, and wave the other guy. And send him to Stockton? Yep. And the, I'm assuming that Mackey will be sent down. But, you know, the other two... So Mackey's 25. Is he waiver eligible now? Oh, yeah. He was last year, too. So, it, it's one of those that... Um, yeah. Like, it, it. frankly, it's... You have to be better than Stone and Good Branson. Like, really, at this point, like, that should not be a hard hurdle to climb over if you're wanting to be an NHL player. And, you know, like, you have to have the effort level and showing the competency that you can. Because those guys are reliable. They're not great, but they're good enough for a seven, six, seven guy. You know, you just have to beat, beat that. And, you know, after one game, yes. But, you know, as you said, consistency was the issue. Can he go do that again? Can he go do it again after that? Can he go do it again after that? Yeah. And if that's the case, then, hey, awesome, great. We have a really good number six now. If not, then, you know, well, I guess Stone's in the lineup. And, you know, Shellington gets away again. And you know what? Again. I have no problem with Stone or Good Branson no. as my number six. No, me either. And, you know. If I had to send one of them down, I think it would be Stone because he played in Stockton a little bit and he was seen as a good mentor down there. Yeah, I, I can don't see know who Branson would be. Yeah, I can see that. Um, let's just if Shillington is seen as a guy who who doesn't have it and can't beat those two, do you try to sneak him through waivers or do you try oh, and yeah. trade him for a pick? Uh, waivers, because he he won't get claimed. You know, like if he doesn't beat Stone or Branson, like everybody kind of knows what those level those exactly. guys are. That if he can't beat those two guys, like, it's like, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, you're so awesome that you can't, I think, you know. I think you're right. He gets sent down, but I think then he's probably the first guy that gets packaged with something at that point. Yeah. Like, I think at that point, you know, you send him down because you want him to play, but as soon as you need something to package, he's the guy that would get packaged. Yeah, it's sort of, like, at that point, you're looking at more of, like, a Klimchuk for Nielsen type trade where, you know, you at, Team X has a struggling forward that has potential. We have a struggling defenseman who has potential. Hey, let's see if we can't figure, you know, just a chain of scenery. Yeah, or I could out. see, or I could see doing a deal with a team later that maybe they've got a defenseman hurt and they say, well, this guy in the past has shown he could be good enough. Let's bring him in, you know, and put yeah. him as our number six or seven and give him a shot. You're not going to trade just for him, but if it was say Monahan and him, yeah, you know, for really the Monahan return or something like that, yeah. It's one of those, yeah, it, it's just, yeah, it, we'll see. Like, we don't really have a complete set of information yet because it's only but one I th- game. But I think you're you're right, though. We don't have to force him in the lineup. Like, I feel like maybe we've had to in the past. It's up to him where he plays. Yeah, and which that's where, like, I'm kind of grateful that we're in the post-Giordano era just because of the fact that, well, now you guys have to sort things out for yourself, so you kind of have to go and get on that <laughs> and you know and then we can respond whether we need to go trade for a de- good defenseman or sign a good defenseman or you know we're good as it is or whatever we just have to wait and see and well on that post Giordano era idea is there anybody is there really any question who the top pair is this year I've heard some people say that it should be Zadorov Tanev to me it's got to be Hannafin Tanev yeah I agree I think Hannafin is the heir apparent. He and Tanev played well last year. I think, again, it's his spot to lose, but I think you've got to give him that shot. And he has been a number one, two guy in the league in the past. We forget that. In Carolina, he was that guy. Yeah, exactly. So we'll see. Um, We'll see how – like, that's the thing. Like, with all the young defensemen the Flames have, who knows? Yeah, like, who knows what each of those guys – they all have the potential to be good. Will they actually play that way? Who knows? We won't really know until probably January, February, how things are going. And my last question for you today, uh, while we're focused on training camp, is what do you think the probability is that Adam Werner would take Dan Vleiter's spot as the backup? If Vladar gets hurt, then yes. Otherwise, no. I would agree. Vladar needs to clear waivers. I don't think the Flames would want to acquire him and send him down because he might get taken by somebody. Oh, he probably would. 
So I think it's his spot to earn. And I think I think Warner could easily be up here at some point, but I don't think for a long term. I think he'd be your injury replacement. Yeah. Even if he looks better than Vladar, I think you still send him back down unless he's significantly better. Yeah. Just because of numbers. I agree. But again, I'll be interested to see what happens. I wonder if the Flames will be carrying a couple extra guys or if there's some exception made for teams like the Flames whose uh, farm team is in the States. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I'm just guessing. I don't know. Yeah, it's really tough, so. Um, and then my last question here is, do you think that Byron Ritchie's on the opening day lineup? Yes. I would agree. I don't think in a lot Brett of other Ritchie, coaches here. Yeah. Brett Ritchie, that's right, yeah. Um, I don't think with a lot of other coaches Ritchie would be, but I think Daryl really likes him, and I think Daryl's going to keep him around. Yeah. I, I don't know if he should be in the lineup, but I think he will be. Yeah, well... Yeah, he basically is the prototypical Daryl Sutter fourth line forward. Oh, that's it. You know, like you, you look at, uh, as I mentioned before, with Andreoff, Lewis, and Jordan Nolan, you know, like Richie is basically Andreoff in that role. You know, mm-hmm. so yeah, it makes entire sense. Um, we'll see. Um, but yeah, I would be somewhat shocked if Richie wasn't playing a more significant ice time rule on the, you know, like in terms of actual playing time versus some of the other guys, but could be right. I mean, he's wearing 24 this year, which tells you he's probably not going anywhere. He's got a real, a big boy number. Yeah. So he's probably going to be sticking around. Yeah. Which that's good. And we'll see, you know, like this whole team, like I think that this season is really, um, where this team needs to grow up or we need to get new people. And we've said that for a couple of years. Well, how would you say it? Um, with all of COVID, I think that kind of just gave a bit of an excuse. And plus like with this year being the last year of Kachuk and Gaudreau's contracts and like with Monaghan only having one year after this, that now, you know, like if the Flames can't elevate and can't put a proper season together, then, like, there's really no point in signing Gaudreau. And, like, there's no point in Monaghan continuing. And there's no point in, like, not necessarily a point in Kachuk, even. Possibly. So you're saying if they can't get good, it could be a hell of a deadline for this team. Yeah, exactly. And it's one of those where... You know, especially as bad as it is to say, like, the next handful of drafts are deep and well-stocked. And, you know, like, if the Flames can't elevate, if you're going to suck, this is pretty much a good time to do so. And as bad as that is, and, like, you look at how Ottawa went from being in the conference finals, like, four years ago, and now they're a good young and up and coming team again. Like it does, you don't necessarily have to be in the wilderness forever. You know, like if things do bottom out, like this team, like if they're not in a playoff spot or are barely in a playoff spot uh, come trade deadline day, I would be all for selling the farm. You know, like anything that's not stapled down, move it. Because. You know, it, like, you need to be able to show that you're more than, like, oh, that'll do. Yeah. Well, it's a long way between now and the trade deadline. So, oh, folks, the trade deadline, when we get there, we haven't even started the season yet, and we've still got five more exhibition games to get ourselves through. Oh, I know. It's just one of those storylines to look for throughout the season. So it's uh, it's the start of our 10th season, and we've got, like I said, five more exhibition games. So enjoy those. Get ready. There's a, a nice kind of week break, which we usually don't see this year, uh, the 9th to the 15th when the Flames play no hockey. And then we'll start the regular season on the 16th against Edmonton. So enjoy these next five games. Just for anyone that's not aware, on the 1st of October is an exhibition game versus Vancouver. Then on the second, the next night, we go to Kent, Washington to play against the Seattle Kraken. Their arena, I don't think, is ready yet, so they're playing a few of their games in various different Washington cities. Uh, Then we get a break. We're in Edmonton on the 4th, and then we're in Winnipeg on the 6th, and then we're back here to close out our exhibition schedule versus Winnipeg on the 8th. Those are all... um, 
I was going to say all 7 p.m. start times, but they're not. The uh, Seattle game is a late one at 6, and the Winnipeg game in Winnipeg, or sorry, the Seattle one's a late one at 8. The Winnipeg game's an early one at 6. So all roughly the same times. But yeah. that's the rest of the schedule, and we'll see how these guys look and if Shillington can earn himself a spot in the lineup in those five games. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how the new line shape up over the next five games and how the veteran players actually shake out and which, if any, young guys can push for spots. Well, Matt, let's watch intently, and I will talk to you next time. Yep, and as always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.